Today, the Supreme Court begins hearing oral arguments for McDonald versus Chicago, which directly challenges the city of Chicago's gun bans. What would you like to see from the court? Uh, this is a difficult case because I'm a firm supporter of the Second Amendment rights that every individual should have those particular rights. On the other hand, this has a tough question of what states' rights have in relationship to the federal government. So I don't see this as a black versus right. There's a lot of gray area in this particular decision. I would like them to say that, yeah, the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights are individual rights as well as they are um, governmental rights. But at the same time, I hope that they don't do too much to destroy the idea of, uh, of states' sovereignty and states' ability to make decisions in all areas. On your website, you have posted a leaked uh, Department of Interior document which detailed discussions about naming up to 17 areas in the West as national monuments. What would be the implications of federal government taking over this land? Most of this land is already federal land, but in, within those documents there are some abilities to try and acquire more private land and put it into the federal registry. The, the, the problem with this approach is that simply what they're trying to do is bypass Congress as well as the states on how the land will best be managed and best be used. So it's a management concept. By putting it as a national monument, that is the most restrictive use that they can put into that particular land. And to do it without the consent of other areas has all sorts of negative and implied consequences that these guys are not thinking about. So for example, the last time when President Clinton used the Antiquities Act, abused the Antiquities Act to create a national monument. It had impacts on school trust lands, it had impact on rural utility corporations, it had impact on the development of, of coal resources in the state. All of those were side issues that they didn't quite think through. So the Antiquities Act upon which they were going to use is very specific as to how it's supposed to be used, as to the size of the area, the types of things to be protected, and you have to show there's an imminent harm. President Clinton didn't do any of that. And so far, it looks like these people weren't going to do any of that either. Um, so it's kind of like, I think Doc Hastings said the best analogy. He says, when you hear something in the kitchen, you flip on the light, and someone's got his hand in the cookie jar, it's hard to believe they're actually counting the cookies to report to you later. The EPA has been a source of controversy this year after announcing that it would seek to regulate CO2 emissions. You've been very critical of this decision. Why is this a bad idea? Well, first of all, it's, an ex it's a legislative function that is being usurped by an executive branch, and that should not ever be the case. Secondly, this is an executive branch that has very little accountability to the legislative side, uh, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's, a, it's a violation of the principles of balance of power. And, and also philosophically, the reason that you have that balance of power horizontally between three branches of government and vertically between the federal government and the states is to protect individual liberties. If indeed the EPA takes on this legislative function and acquires it and uses legislative and executive function for the same issue, somewhere down the road, the person that's going to be hit is an individual who gets hit in the crosshairs between an all-powerful bureaucracy that has taken on too much authority. And I think that's why you see so much pushback from both Republicans and Democrats, a bipartisan pushback against EPA for doing something it was never designed to do and ought not be given the power to do.